scared for me now. Hey, it's Chris O'Neill. Adam Perry. And this time around, From Dust Till Dawn, the 1996 film, Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino teaming up. It's actually a concept and a story by Robert Kutzman, who's a screenwriter, producer, makeup guy himself. But yeah, Tarantino wrote the script. Robert Rodriguez shot it. He always says shot instead of film. But yeah, you've got a, a pair of American criminals who have been robbing banks and all sorts of places. <laughs> You get the impression they've been on like a like a like a a, a robbery spree here, mm-hmm. but they have to take the loot down to Mexico and they well take a family as hostage along the way to cross into Mexico peacefully, but ultimately they find themselves trapped in a saloon where dun 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 plot twist it's frequented by vampires. <laughs> Talk about the, uh, it, it's a little too long, but talk about one of the ultimate like grindhouse B-movie quality. We were talking about yeah. B-movie quality last yeah. week. This one, even though it did very well financially, it definitely has a B-movie vibe to it. Sure. And, um, you know, just like most horror movies in the 90s, you know, it has the the horror camp, you know, right. all in there. and uh, Yeah. Well, it's an action get, horror film. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's it's a it's a lot of fun, and it, you know, talk about two interesting actors at the time. There was Matthew McConaughey, and you had George Clooney. Now George Clooney was shooting ER. That's all I knew him for, right? And then I saw him in this movie. I'm like, wow, <laughs> it was yeah. a completely different role. <laughs> you know, Matthew McConaughey also the same year he did. You know, at the time he was noted for his you know, prestigious leading man roles, and also the romantic lead mm-hmm. and romantic comedies. All the women fawned over him, and here he is playing a twisted psychopath in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the next generation. Right. You know, both actors really going against type here. And, and of course, the, the top billed actor is Harvey Keitel. Mm-hmm. He's a, a pastor experiencing a crisis of faith brought on by the death of his wife. He's on vacation with his teenage children. Of course, they stop at the end and are kidnapped by the Gecko brothers, and Tarantino... He's probably a weak link in the movie casting. He he cast himself in it, or I think Robert Rodriguez wanted him to play it. It's interesting choice, but it, it would have been interesting if, like, say the guy who ran the convenience store at the beginning was his other brother instead of Tarantino. Yeah. But it, either way, yeah. it's a, it's a it is a, a a fun movie for the most part. You get interesting performances not only by Keitel, Clooney, but also Juliette Lewis, Cheech Marin playing a few different roles. You had the football player and mm-hmm. black exploitation actor Fred Williamson in it. Yeah, you had Tom Savini. Oh, you know, we'll talk to Tom Savini yeah. in a second. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's the ultimate like cult movie cast. Yeah, and, and it all showed up in one movie. It, and of course, Danny Trejo, who I course. believe was homeless uh, prior to his roles in Heat, Desperado, and if, uh, again, he's teamed up with. Robert Rodriguez so many times, I think Danny Trejo just loves and appreciates the guy for giving him his break, you know? Mm -hmm. He's the infamous uh, barkeeper there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And he shows up there. Unfortunately, there's two other direct-to-video sequels. I think Robert Rodriguez kind of wrote the script for the third one, The Hangman's Daughter. But this one is the one that hit on all cylinders. And it's just, it is fun to watch, even though it just runs like 20 minutes too long, I think. But other than that, I mean, Salma Hayek, she's very yeah. memorable in a, a, her second collaboration with Robert Rodriguez as well. Right. You know, and again, you know, you're talking about the cast, you know, let's not forget John Saxon is FBI yeah, agent. Yeah, well, he has a little small cameo. The yeah. late Kelly Preston has a small yes. little part in it. So and this is 1990s all over it. Right, right. And another interesting character that kind of appears in a lot of Tarantino films is Michael Parks. Mm-hmm. He he plays Earl, the, the sheriff guy, Earl McGraw. Yep. He actually played this role in Kill Bill, Volume 1. He was also in Death Proof and Planet Terror. So he's kind of a... The link. He's kind yeah. of the link of Robert Rodriguez, Tarantino. They love him and this character. And they the, the diehard Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez film geeks, mm-hmm. they kind of time it out. And all of those movies, Kill Bill, Volume 1, Death Proof, and Planet Terror, all occurred before the storyline from Dust Till Dawn because he gets blown away in the first five minutes. (laughs) But 
Either way, I mean, we could like tear apart, you know, but it, it is a lot of fun to watch. And there, there are so many memorable lines in the movie. I'm not going to, you know, a lot of them are swear words, but Cheech Marin utters the F word several times. He's the first sure. character to do it in the movie. Yeah. But it, it is, it, it's a lot, of, a lot of fun as we've mentioned, but it spawns so many, there was a, there was a computer game in the early two yep. thousands. And of course there were two direct to video sequels and the then TV there was show. a TV show. Did you ever watch any of the sequels? Or the the TV series? Uh, I did not. Yeah, I, I, I just I didn't dare to. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't yeah. want to ruin my love yeah. for this movie. Yeah, and I did love it. You know, I, I, I you know again it doesn't one hundred percent work because it just went on way too long. But it's still, I mean, just just the 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 dialogue. I mean, Tarantino. No one writes dialogue better than Tarantino. Yeah, there's very few who can, and it's just he just hits on all the cylinders in this one, and he gets. A lot of his uh, grindhouse um, influences put in this movie as well, mm-hmm. and you know Tom Savini with the the belt. <laughs> yeah, you well, know, it's just a know, lot of fun. And, you know, and that's just a, you know, especially um, you know probably my most favorite thing about watching horror movies is is, is watching the uh, the execution of the the special effects and stuff. Like, and mm-hmm. uh, um, this is you know this is before uh, the the computer age where you know everything was done practically and. Uh, I, I just loved it. It was like um, Rodriguez and Tarantino said, uh, Tom, uh, do what you do and have fun. Right. And he had fun. Yeah, and he got so into it, he was punching people. He even hit yeah. George Clooney in the face. Yeah. I was reading about that. He just got so into it, had so much fun. He was literally hurting people on the set. Yeah. I, I, I don't think he meant to. He just got yeah. caught up in the fun. But, yeah, you, he hit George Clooney pretty hard from what I understand. <laughs> But and, uh, I mean, the, the special effects in this movie are just yeah, absolutely makeup, fantastic, yes. and uh, the the blood gags, and you know, I, you know, the, the the gun, you know, crotch belt. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> you know, uh, I was just going to say uh, his crotch revolver has yeah. been the source of a lot of debate. Some people thought it was a terrible idea because the recoil would be like punching yourself in the groin. It's <laughs> like okay, is is, right. and I guess this was there was an interview with uh, Tom Savini. And he justified the recoil issue by stating that during his time in the army, because you mentioned it earlier when we were talking about Don of the Dead, he served in the Vietnam War. Yeah, he, he was a photographer. Yeah, and they tested the recoil of an M16 by re- placing it on various parts of the human body, including the chin and the crotch with no injury whatsoever. Uh, apparently, it could be belt fed. There was one cil- cylinder that holds the bullets. The other one holds the spent shells. Its resemblance to a revolver is just cosmetic, and the cod piece itself might be reinforced and padded to reduce the recoil, particularly since the firing pin and the trigger mechanism, and the film shows that it was fired by a hand pump, would need the additional room. <laughs> can, so it's like, I, you know, talk about a fun prop, but this, I mean, Tom Savini was a, uh, uh, an expert in not only makeup but also creating these different things on the sets of movies. Uh, he helped I, out. Uh, he helped brilliant. out with a lot of a lot of uh, George Romero stuff. But another uh, interesting, uh, you know, if you're a teenager watching the film like I was watching Salma Hayek's memorable cameo. Well, yeah, she did not want to do that because of the snakes. She's oh. like she was petrified of snakes. I can't blame her there. No, I, I guess you can't. Yeah. Robert Rodriguez kind of guilted her into it by saying Madonna was up for the role too. So she met with a psychiatrist who got her over <laughs> her fear and she was able to do it. And she did not have a choreographer for her dance because according to her, you, you can't choreograph the live snake she wore around her neck. Mm-hmm. And you got to imagine having that big snake around you. Obviously yeah. it was a trained snake, but talk about if you're petrified of snakes, that that must have been an intense sequence. So Rodriguez just told her to feel the music and dance to it, and what she did, and you know, she and Tarantino did. got to fulfill his foot fetish yes. right there. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that the this that scene could be filmed in today's sensitive. You know, uh, a lot of these movies can't, especially no. this one. I mean, we're we're talking about a bar that's called the Titty Twister. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, <laughs> it, it's just it, it. And Green Blood was used for the vampires to to get past the censors because let's put it this way: I yeah. mean, 
if it was red blood, it would just there's just no way. Yeah, just no way. The movie would have been rated X, and it wouldn't have had a, a theatrical release. And again, they obviously weren't sure because remember how I mentioned January studios will release movies they're either unsure of or they have no faith in. Right. And this movie was an unsure movie. Like most of Robert Rodriguez movies, they really don't know how it's going to do. So they put it right in the middle of January and it became a huge hit worldwide. Absolutely. Massive hit. A $19 million budget making $59.3 million. Yeah. Let's talk about the soundtrack from Dust Till Dawn. Quite the interesting mix of music on here, I must say. Absolutely. I mean, you had ZZ Top. I, I remember when I first saw the movie and was listening to this really hard, hard, hard stuff. And then I hear Billy Gibbons sing, like, oh man, that's ZZ Top. It's like I was surprised to hear that ZZ Top was on there. Also, Stevie Ray and Jimmy Vaughn were on there. Yep. Were, were in there too. And Graham Ravel's Dark Knight by the Blasters. That was awesome having that. I mean, it's just a good tune. That's the only mm-hmm. time I've actually heard the song being played. Mm hmm. But what are your thoughts on the soundtrack? Because, man, you're a rock fan, so you must have been in your glory, especially with Stevie Ray Vaughan and ZZ Top. This soundtrack is um, one of the really cool things about 90s cinema is it seemed like the soundtrack was almost just as important as uh, the movie itself. Look at a dud. I thought it was a dud. I thought it was terrible. It was Last Action Hero. The soundtrack was so much better than the film, the rock Mm -hmm soundtrack and of course the crow and the crow i mean crow is yes. one of the best soundtracks wayne's world that actually made bohemian rhapsody a hit when yeah it wasn't when it first came out yeah yeah i mean so you're looking at this track list and like i said you got um the mexican blackbird by uh zz top yeah you know, i mean that was it's cool. a it's a unknown zz top song but still yeah it's one of the good, album deep cuts I think. yeah good. <laughs> but then you you know you get another again and you know this is more my cup of tea you know you hear willie the wimp mm, by uh yeah the, the Va- stevie ray and one. jimmy vaughn yeah and, i mean me as a big blues fan and a big stevie ray vaughn fan I right mean, and to I hear ha- a yeah. song like willie the wimp it was ironic who played at that particular moment in the film too yeah, the soundtrack is great, and of course, the rock band there, Tito and the Tarantula, who played the band in the movie, yes. they had some good music, too. They sure did. The soundtrack you can probably get somewhere. You can probably download it or listen to it on Spotify. It's just an awesome soundtrack, yeah. for sure. You've heard me kind of rant and rave on how it was too long. I mean, it would have been an even better movie if it was like 20 minutes shorter. I'd give it three and a half stars just because I can rewatch this movie. Right. It is rewatchable. It is fun for the most part, but man, it could have been like 20 minutes shorter, and it would have been like a four or four and a half for me i agree with that you know i it did drag on um a little bit um yeah this movie you know this is like a you know 3.2 3.3 for me more open to watching it than not the special effects being done by greg nicotero and uh you add a little tom savini in there i mean it's just you know to me as a horror fan as a genre fan that's really where a lot of this hits for me way they did the vampires and and the the gags and the different kills it's just like a blast to watch and you know like you're, you're jumping and then you're laughing your ass off at the same time. Right. It's just one of those cool mixtures of camp, action, horror, and everything. Right. You can obviously tell like they had a lot of fun making it, but it wasn't like we were talking about Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back where they're having more fun than audience. The audience is having just as much Which, fun watching it as probably they had filming it. Cheech mm-hmm. Marin, three yeah. hilariously different roles in the movie. Yes. And he's just <laughs> so fun to watch. I you mean, know, everybody it, in this movie is fun. Yeah. I mean, and I, I know you weren't uh, too big on the... Uh, the Tarantino casting, I thought he and George Clooney played fantastic off of each other. Yeah, it was yeah. it wasn't bad. I just think if they wanted a more horrific thing is having the guy who played the convenience store owner. Yeah. John Hawks is the guy's name. He plays Pete Bottoms, the guy who owns the convenience store. I've seen him play some pretty intense roles. Again, if if you had him in the movie, I guess you could argue. I can see some arguments like, oh, it would have been too serious. I think he has. A, he could have played it in a way where he could get his wit. Uh, he could deliver Tarantino's witty lines, but also be completely frightening at the same time. Right. Because Tarantino really didn't frighten me. He just kind of had like the. He he did like a, a a a creepo stare, but I wasn't afraid of him or anything like that. And I doubt Juliet Lewis was either. <laughs> he did okay. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying he was the worst thing, but when he cast himself in his movies, they're usually the weakest part of the movie. Like Django Unchained mm-hmm. cast himself in Pulp Fiction, and he was you know it could have been someone else playing it, but it, right. again, I mean, I, I mean, we're I'm, I'm not trying to be too nitpicky here, but John Hawks just watching the other cast members, John Hawks. The guy who played Pete, the guy who owned the store, probably 
probably would have been a better gecko brother. He just has right. he has look for it. He has the vibe for it too. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's like uh, okay, this is George Clooney's brother, you know, because George Clooney, a lot of women find attractive. You know, just my two cents. I, I still think overall it is a very watchable movie. From Dust Till Dawn, I, again, I could not bring myself to watch. I did see the first few minutes of From Dust Till Dawn 2. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, oh, Bruce Campbell, I'll, I'll watch this. And, he, and it's like he gets killed within the first five minutes. And it happens to be a movie that someone else is watching on TV. And it's like, okay, I, I know it's a whole trick and it was, you know, trying to do something, but I couldn't watch it after that because I'm like, okay, I'm invested in this movie. And. Oh, it's not even the movie. Okay. <laughs> Psych. Psych. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I, I haven't even bothered with any of the sequels. Yeah, I didn't. You know, I just, that was as far it, as I got with yeah. From Dust Till Dawn too. But um, To me, the, the first one's enough. Right. That's you like know. the Matrix. To me, yeah. the first Matrix, the other ones don't exist in, in my reality. So, <laughs> But whether you like the rest of the movies or not, or maybe you love all three of the From Dust Till Dawn films, you know, I highly recommend it. I hope you can seek it out if you haven't already. Even if you have, it's been a while, watch it again because it's so much fun. Even though it does drag a little bit, it, it is a lot of fun to watch. And don't watch with a squeamish because uh, if you or someone else kind of sensitive to gore, even though it's cartoonish, it is pretty violent. Very violent. Very, very violent. We'll see you next time on Scared for Reels. Ha 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 ha.